prevalent in today's secular rock music. We don't have to search for hidden words and backmasking to hear the devil's influence in today's pop sounds. We've got people paying to hear groups like Black Sabbath, Slayer, with their album titled Hell Awaits, Venom, who titled an album Welcome to Hell, and Demon, who titled an album Possessed. The fact is that you never hear these secular rock groups denounce Buddha or Muhammad. They're only against Jesus or anti-Christ. So don't you be deceived by their demon-praising, money-making tactics. ...deals with devil worship and satanic beliefs. It contains explicit scenes and descriptions of violent crimes and rituals. Because of the program's theme and controversial subject matter, parental discretion should be exercised. As a population trying to coexist with one another, we often do so by having the same goals, even if we disagree on the ways to achieve them. In pursuit of that harmony, we moralize everything from our entertainment to our private lives, and we look to each other for confirmation that we're on the right path. We hold a special place in our hierarchy of morals for children and animals as the representations of innocence. Innocence that is to be protected at all cost and without question. You would be hard pressed to find anyone worth associating with who didn't agree that children deserve a special place in our mission. The lines of good and evil have been drawn countless times over the centuries, and while we like to think the boundaries are obvious to all, that often isn't the case and predators are looking to take advantage of our trusting nature. Today I'm going to tell a set of stories, the best that I can, to see if we can't put ourselves in the shoes of an American population dealing with a rise in satanic cult activity. Everywhere we look, there are evildoers in the dark looking to violate the tenets we hold sacred and harm the innocents we all band together to protect. And as such, we become hypervigilant as we read headline after headline about Lucifer's infiltration into our communities, and suddenly, our neighbors begin to look a little more suspicious. This is the story of Satanic Panic. Satanism goes far beyond teenage obsession. Today there are cults that worship the devil, engage in secret ceremonies, believe in ancient, though bizarre theology. Every single kid that we, whose case we know about, who committed a violent act in Satan's name was also into heavy metal music. Disclaimer. This video does not serve to take any religious stand or avow or disavow any practice, worship, or following of any particular religious traditions. Hawk and Lode's stance is to be nice to each other, sympathize, and empathize with your fellow human beings, and that dogs f***ing <coughs> rule and are totally the best thing humans have ever accomplished. Threading heavy metal into the fabric of my identity has exposed me to some wild lyrical and visual content. I get that it also makes me a bit of a douchebag, but at least I'm self-aware. From Black Sabbath's original dark occult themes to Cannibal Corpse, whose lyrics would get this video plunged into censorship hell, Satan is a recurring character in the headbanger extended universe. With the importance of religion through the progression of our existence as a species, Fundamental laws of good and evil are hardwired into the way we interpret the world. And with our propensity to anthropomorphize these psychological concepts, the idea of the devil, or something akin to him, exists in almost every culture. In Judaism, Satan is an entity testing and tempting mankind off the path under direct service to God. For Christians, he's similar, but as an adversary or challenger to God meant to taint his magnum opus. But definitions, origins, and theological accuracy aren't going to be all that important. 
Satanic panic as a concept and era of American history often refers to a specific period between the 1980s and the 1990s. But its roots run much deeper, and to explain how the American population became susceptible to it, we need to start a bit further back. America at war. In New York, masked flags leading 500,000 marchers in the greatest patriotic and military demonstration ever seen in this or any country. Dramatic living symbols of America's solidarity, America's unity of purpose. Today, these troops march to the cheers of their countrymen. Tomorrow, they will be on their way to the far-flung battlefronts of the world. The post-World War II era in the United States is what many consider to be the nation's golden age. Recovering from the Great Depression, the economy boomed. This era saw the emergence of the baby boomer generation who were unfamiliar with their parents' past struggles. American consumerism flourished, symbolized by the American dream of suburban homes and white picket fences. Parenting in America reached a turning point, influenced by Dr. Benjamin Spock, a renowned pediatrician who advocated for permissive parenting. However, in reaction to this, many families clung to a traditional, strict parenting style, valuing harsh discipline and religious practice. As a response to their children's troubling behaviors, many sought to blame external influences, pointing out the difficulties of parenting in America during times of significant cultural change. Altogether, a rigid moral structure was forming where you respected your parents, went to church on Sundays, and if children began to behave poorly, well, it couldn't possibly be the parents' fault. Well, if it isn't mom and dad, who are corrupting my children? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, from New York, the Ed Sullivan Show. The 1950s in the utopian state of the country gave birth to the teenager. They weren't quite children, but not yet adults, and the most important thing teenagers had were money and time. Their lack of responsibility and surplus of disposable income meant a huge market had opened up, and the more business savvy among the population were capitalizing on it. Drive-in movies, fast food, and soda fountains were among the many new businesses popping up aimed at this new segment of the American consumer. And as a result, teenagers were the pilots of pop culture. Mapping out exactly the origins of rock and roll is a Goliathan task. It's debated violently by people who are much smarter than I am, but one thing is certain. Rock and roll is built on the foundation of the blues. Also, it scared the f*** out of the lost generation. So, I guess technically that's two things. The 20s and 30s saw the rise of blues with legends like Robert Johnson, as well as gospel and rhythm music. With a religious presence and the Great Depression being a staple of the time, it would birth myths like the aforementioned Johnson selling his soul to the devil at a crossroads in Mississippi in exchange for amazing guitar ability and success. And with Johnson dying in 1938 at only 27 years old, it was easy for legends like this to spread and take root. Jump blues and boogie-woogie styles of music rose to prominence throughout the 1940s, and by the beginning of the 1950s American exceptionalism boom, all of the ingredients for rock and roll would be on the table. Ike Turner's Rocket 88 is frequently lauded as rock and roll's first song released in 1951. A year later, radio DJ Alan Freed dubbed the music rock and roll cementing what is probably the most important movement in music we have or will ever see. Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, Richie Valens, Buddy Holly, and a whole list of other artists would put rock and roll on top of popular culture and ignite a massive moral panic. Parents all across the country were certain that rock and roll was corrupting the newly minted teenagers and leading to terrible life-altering crimes like juvenile delinquency. Race played a role as well, with white citizens fearing potential race mixing in the early days of the civil rights movement. With the teenage adoption of rock and roll and how prominent and integral to the culture that it was, 
it did likely have some positive influence on desegregation efforts. And like any good music, parents feared sexual elements and suggestive dancing, with televised performances by Elvis being strictly filmed from the waist up so that his magic, mind-corrupting dick didn't burrow into anyone's brains. It seems pretty tame from our seat in the future, but a real concern was plaguing conservative parental figures, with some radio stations even banning the music. Elvis Presley alone would be a highly targeted figure when it came to controversy. By the time the Beatles had their first performance on The Ed Sullivan Show, kicking off Beatlemania and the British Invasion, the population was sure these musicians were brainwashing their kids and putting the blame for their delinquent actions on the shoulders of these giants. You know, instead of it being poor parenting or the wild stigma around mental health. Culture war is not a new phenomenon. It's been happening in some way as far back as humans can remember. Once we began to outgrow isolated tribes and start to lay claim and plant flags on hills in the world around us, we began to bang heads over our culture and what is and isn't acceptable. Nowadays, political grifters will package hyperbolic points and sell them with fear and be some of the biggest names in both legacy and new media. And while movements like the civil rights movement would certainly challenge cultural norms, they were rooted in fundamental human rights. While modern-day culture warriors use human rights as justifications for their grift, I would personally place the civil rights movement into a different and more important category. But the concept as we know it may have likely started with the free love counterculture movement of the 1960s, or as its members are more popularly referred to as hippies. The hippies sought to cast out the social norms established in the 50s, and alongside psychedelic experimentation and the adaptation of Eastern religious practices, the movement did well to scare the hell out of the anti-communist conservative population. It was a hard fork in the American political system, and only continued the moral panic rise throughout the country. Now, instead of welcoming soldiers home after World War II, they were protesting the participation of the United States in the Vietnam War. Instead of gathering at drive-ins, soda fountains, and church, Woodstock was where they gathered together to show their numbers and shout their message. With the establishment of LaVey and Satanism in 1966, a collective of followers would enter the public consciousness, furthering background fears of occult practitioners. Their use of ritual magic would be quite the spectacle to anyone with an even mildly religious upbringing. Even with a motive of personal empowerment, and no actual worshipping of any deity, just their existence would shock and awe. With such a prevalence in people's lives, Christian religions often injected Satan into their moral panics, but few of them outright devolved into madness beyond claims of subtle corruption by people fighting against normality. That was until Charlie Manson got involved. And when I stand on the mountain and I say, do it! It gets done. If it don't get done, then I'll move on it. And that's the last thing in the world you want me to do. Charles Manson was born the bastard son of 16-year-old Kathleen Maddox, who spent most of Charlie's early childhood incarcerated. Visiting her was an experience that would traumatize the young boy, and as he grew into a young man, he would see himself falling into similar traps. He spent most of his adulthood going in and out of prison for various petty crimes. He was an aspiring musician and showman with a natural manipulative charisma, but his talent as a songwriter failed to get him anywhere. As Manson discovered the free love movement, like a chameleon, he began to adapt himself to that culture. There are a few ways that people have interpreted Manson's actions leading up to his national infamy. Manson arrived in San Francisco at the height of the hippie movement. As he learned more about the free love philosophy, he began to adapt it to his ideas and proselytize to others, attracting a small following of impressionable young girls in the process. He took on the role of spiritual guru to these young men and women, and as their allegiances cemented, would begin to direct them in increasingly diabolical ways. Whether it was running narcotics and being involved with biker gangs to other petty crimes, a select few of the family would do any and everything Manson directed them to do. In a scene described by one investigator as reminiscent of a weird religious rite, five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Polyansky. On the night of August 8th, 1969, Manson directed four of his followers to go to 10050 Celio Drive in Los Angeles, the home of actress Sharon Tate and her husband, director Roman Polanski. 
Polanski was out of the country, but Tate, who was eight months pregnant, and four others were viciously killed. The following night, Manson took part in selecting the next targets. He and his followers murdered Lino and Rosemary LaBianca in their home. The attacks were animalistic and brutal, with the family leaving misspelled ominous messaging on the walls in blood. With Sharon Tate's high-profile status, a media frenzy ensued surrounding the events and aftermath. The offending members of Manson's crew were later arrested for vandalism, but a deeper investigation connected them to the Tate and LaBianca slaves. A wandering band of members of a so-called religious cult with a leader they call Jesus has had three of its followers arrested in the investigation of the murder of Sharon Tate and six others. The trial of Charles Manson and the family was an absolute circus. As the apocalyptic motives came to light and Manson was filmed with his schizophrenic outbursts, the zeitgeist was filled with brainwashed satanic cult fears and even fiction. Charles Manson, Helter Skelter, and the family were a cultural phenomenon, jumped on by anti-communist idealists to show the dangers of the free love and hippie movement, effectively demonizing the larger wave of counterculture and may have even planted seeds of fear in the minds of millions. Were there more of these cults among us? I was to respect die with a degree of dignity. Lay down your life with dignity. Don't lay down with tears and agony. There's nothing to death. It's like Max said, it's just stepping over into another plane. Don't, don't be this way. Stop this hysterics. This is not the way for people who are socialist to communists to die. No way for us to die. We must die with some dignity. Alongside the evolution of the culture, Jim Jones, a progressive Southern preacher, founded and ran his people's temple. Beginning in the 1950s, Jones aimed for racial and social equality, attracting a following as diverse as you would imagine for the times as the civil rights and free love movement raged on through the American culture. Behind the scenes, however, Jones was being increasingly scrutinized for potential abuses and financial fraud, and in response, he moved his congregation to a remote plot of land in Guyana in 1977, promising a utopian self-governed commune out of reach of the corrupted politicians in the United States. The reality of the Jonestown commune was much darker with members realizing quickly that this was far from the utopia promised by their charismatic leader. Rampant abuse and Jones's substance use spiraled him into a psychosis, manifesting in powerful paranoia. The families of the members back in the States called for investigations into the commune, a fateful visit by U.S. Congressman Leo Ryan, who went himself to investigate claims of forced service, abuse, and Jim Jones's tyrannical rule over the congregation would result in an ambush after he was tipped off by members that some wanted desperately to leave but had no way out. Once Jones ordered and executed the attack on Ryan, he turned his sights to his remaining congregation, believing that the United States would deploy the military to end them all, forcing all remaining 918 members, 300 of whom were children, to ingest cyanide-laced flavor aid leading to their deaths. The aftermath of the Jonestown Massacre only furthered public fears of cults and the rampant death and destruction that they were responsible for. The gasoline and kindling were set, and all the devil needed at this point was a match. In 1980, a book was published, written by a Canadian woman named Michelle Smith and her psychiatrist, Lawrence Pazder. The book recounts Michelle's harrowing and brutal childhood as she was subjected to intense, and repetitive abuse. Abuse that, if I took the time to detail in the way that she does in this book, this video would be nuked by YouTube. Abuse that she was subjected to by her mother, who was involved with a satanic ritual cult in Victoria, British Columbia. She remembers vividly being brought into this cult to be used and violated, surrounded by satanic worship and black magic occultism. They were memories that Michelle had managed to suppress as she aged into adulthood. After undergoing extensive therapy sessions with her psychiatrist, Dr. Pazder, sessions that included deep hypnosis and other psychotherapeutic techniques, she managed to pull those traumatic memories out of the Pandora's box she had stuffed them into. The ultimate solution for Michelle was direct intervention by the Catholic Church, exercising her of the influence that Satan still had on her, 
even after all these years of black magic scarring. The book became another media sensation upon its release, and Michelle Smith and Dr. Pazder were applauded for their bravery in shining a light on the existence of these satanic cults in North America. Television and radio interviews with the pair would spread her story far and wide. The groundbreaking methods of repressed memory recovery utilized by Dr. Pazder were adopted in practices all across the United States. With Michelle Remembers, the Manson family, and the Jonestown Massacre fresh in the memories of the American public, the existence of these satanic cults was all but confirmed. And as the public began to be hypervigilant, looking intensely at their communities, they would begin to realize that this was just the beginning of something deeply disturbing. Virginia McMartin ran a small, highly regarded preschool in Manhattan Beach, California. The preschool was run by her family, including her daughter Peggy McMartin Bucky and her grandson Ray, with the establishment operating since the mid-1960s. The solid foundation they had built for themselves as an upstanding part of the community set the stage for one of the country's darkest events. In August of 1983, Judy Johnson, a parent whose young son attended the McMartin Preschool, made shocking claims that her son had been abused by Ray Bucky. Her son complained of painful bowel movements and, when questioned by Judy, revealed the abuse, naming Bucky as the offender. Johnson reported this revelation to the police, who were equally as horrified, and brought Bucky in for questioning. In the interest of safety, the police sent a letter to roughly 200 parents, instructing them to question their children on the possibility of other offenses. The letter disturbed and alarmed the parents, naturally, and as parents sat down with their children, more horrifying claims would begin to pour in. The more information the children provided, the darker the claims would get. Claims of satanic occultism, rituals of animal sacrifice, and even an elaborate network of underground tunnels within which these unimaginable horrors took place would emerge as the investigation went on. Parents angrily invaded the grounds to search for the evidence themselves, attempting to locate these tunnels and affirm the horrific stories their children and police were coming forward with. Media coverage of the case would explode across the country. As the tidal wave of allegations emerged, the coverage would get increasingly more sensational. Comparisons to Michelle Smith's story outlined in her book were made, further confirming the existence of these cults and understandably stoking fires of fear and anger across the country. Ray Bucky would be the first to be placed under arrest. Shortly after, Peggy McMartin Bucky, his mother, was also taken into custody. As the investigation progressed, many more members of the McMartin preschool staff were arrested and charged. With the investigation taking several years, national speculation as well as the disturbing details of the case would see the McMartin staff stand accused of running an underground satanic cult, participating in the ritual abuse of the children that were placed under their care by trusting parents. Parents, heed the advice of Pete Rowland's mom. Pay attention. Satanism is not a harmless fad or a passing phase in some of these kids' lives. Ozzy, yeah? I know that your lyrics are less excessive than groups like uh, Slayer or Venom or uh, Iron Maiden or some of the others, but still, do you feel a sense of responsibility, Oz? Richard Allen Casso, Jr., also known as Ricky, was born in March of 1967 in Long Island, New York. Not much is known about his early life, but he had a strained relationship with his father, Ricky Sr., who was a local high school teacher. As Ricky grew into his teenage years, he began to display some troubling and rebellious behavior. He would often butt heads with authority figures and struggled academically. He took to substance use, becoming heavily involved with psychedelics, particularly weed and LSD or acid. He would both use and sell these. Ricky's teenage years coincided with the rise of heavy metal. Bands like Black Sabbath had paved the way in the 1970s, and by the early 80s, the new wave of British heavy metal like Diamond Head and Venom, as well as thrash metal bands like Metallica and Slayer, were running through the subculture underground. By this stage in heavy metal's history as a counterculture element of the art, Satanic imagery and themes were rampant among the catalogs of many heavy metal bands. As such, the headbangers of the time suffered a stigma placed on them by conservative American families and politicians. With Ronald Reagan running on the platform of the Christian conservative, as well as Christianity being threaded into the fabric of the nation, satanic and occult black magic themes were getting under the skin of parents, no matter their political affiliation. 
Among the headbanger masses was Ricky Casso. Ricky dove headfirst into the culture, as many did, and with his outward metalhead appearance and open interest in the occult, he too was subjected to the stigma. When Ricky was 17 years old, he found himself in a wooded area face to face with Gary Lowers, an acquaintance who is believed to have been involved in a related dispute with Ricky previously. Ricky, enraged, launched a brutal attack that lasted a harrowing amount of time, repeatedly stabbing and beating Lowers, demanding that he pledge his love for Satan. Rather than covering his trail and lying low, Ricky would leave Lowers where the attack happened and would begin to boast and brag about the slaying to his friends. Friends who likely knew of Casso's issues and didn't believe him at first, but eventually word would make it to local authorities. When scanning the area of the murder, they would find Gary Lowers' body and would swiftly arrest and question 17-year-old Ricky Casso. After his arrest, Ricky would go on to confess his crime to investigators. But given his generally poor mental state and use of drugs, the confession was barely coherent and made little sense, with Casso telling investigators about demanding Lowers proclaim his love for Satan, but instead he responded with, I love my mother. That detail would get to the press, setting off the high-profile coverage of the Gary Lowers murder at the hands of Ricky Casso, the Acid King. Casso faced second-degree murder charges, and as he sat in his cell awaiting trial, the media would expose and spread the satanic details of the horrifying crime to the public making them aware of the devil among them. Well, Terry, authorities tell us that the most serious or perhaps the most dangerous kind of devil worship comes in the form of underground cults. Most of them are very secretive, usually organizing clandestine rituals in the dark of night. Well, those ceremonies sometimes involve the sharing of animal blood to gain power, they say, but cult members believe their strength really comes from secrecy. In 1991, in Austin, Texas, Fran and Dan Keller owned and operated a daycare in Oak Hill. With nearly a decade since the satanic abuse at the McMartin Preschool was uncovered and prosecuted, parents of young children who attended daycares like the Kellers were particularly vigilant. Fran and her husband Dan decided to open and operate a home-based daycare center. They served working parents in the Oak Hill area in Austin, and by all accounts, they were beloved and respected with no issues reported before August of 1991. That year, a three-year-old girl who had been in the care of the Kellers told her mother that she had been disciplined by Dan with a spanking. The mother, slightly disturbed, took the child to a therapist who concluded that the young girl was showing signs of repeated sexual abuse, likely at the hands of Dan and Fran Keller. As sessions went on, the therapist began to dig into it, and the claims and revelations would become increasingly disturbing. Law enforcement and therapists would get involved, questioning other children who were being cared for by the Kellers, and the horrors of what was going on behind the walls of the Kellers' home would come to light. The victims were relaying tales of the elaborate satanic rituals that included animal sacrifice and the dismemberment of infants. Revelations of a mass grave in the yard for the remains were said to be on the property, and of course, claims of horrific sexual abuse would come to light, and by 1992, law enforcement would take action. In February of 1992, Fran and Dan Keller were charged with aggravated sexual assault of a child. The multiple testimonies had disturbed the public, and the case would be another high-profile uncovering of satanic ritual abuse taking place in communities all across the country. Believe the Children, an organization formed by the parents of the McMartin Preschool case we spoke about earlier, would get involved, making sure parents were informed of what was going on in their community and distributing information on what they could do to keep their children safe. They would educate the public on the phenomenon of recovered memories, and after seeking justice for their children, set out to ensure that justice was served for the Oak Hill victims. The Kellers would see their trial later that year, and with the multiple testimonies of the child victims, as well as the prosecution presenting a medical expert to confirm physical signs of abuse, the jury would take little time in deliberations. They would reach their verdict, and the Kellers were sentenced to 48 years behind bars for their heinous crimes, making the Kellers another example of the rampant satanic worship in the United States and delivering justice once again. Well, not quite.
It's the longest and most expensive criminal trial in U.S. history. And almost since the beginning, there have been suggestions that it never now, needed to take place. That's our story tonight. Back in Manhattan Beach, California, Peggy McMartin Bucky and her son Raymond were on trial for their sustained satanic ritual abuse allegations. Their trial would begin in 1987, four years after the initial accusation surfaced, and the grueling circus would last seven years. There was no evidence outside of the children's testimonies. Testimonies that would include wild, fantastical claims of witches and warlocks, and a twisted example of the vast imagination we all have at that age. On top of that, as the years went on, consistency between them was almost non-existent. Judy Johnson, the parent who would bring forth the first claim, would continue to bring law enforcement exceedingly impossible claims, like her son bearing witness to animal sacrifices and even Raymond Bucky flying through the air. Prosecutors tried their best to build a believable case. They had no physical evidence, but were confident amid the cultural atmosphere that these children were not simply telling tall tales. But the defense would scrutinize and point out the obvious suggestive questioning methods used by law enforcement and therapists. Effectively, these children were led into telling the stories that the adults wanted to hear. It was all sparked by Johnson's claims and panic took the wheel. The entire situation was one of the American justice system's biggest blunders. It would expose everything from dishonest media coverage, questionable law enforcement techniques, and failures in the child protective services sector. In the end, the lack of any physical evidence and unreliability of the children's testimonies saw both Raymond and Peggy acquitted, with all charges failing to stick, and the mother and son returning to their completely shattered lives. Even with these acquittals and lack of any evidence, they were destroyed in the court of public opinion with the media out to sensationalize the situation. Raymond had spent five years in jail awaiting his trial and would attempt to move on after it was all over. Regardless of the legal outcome, much of the public still felt he was guilty and the entire event was profoundly traumatic. The trial and its coverage had left the Buckies financially and emotionally destitute, and they would slip into the shadows in an attempt to move on. It would take years for the culture to catch up and the satanic panic to lift before the world would see the situation for what it was, a witch trial. Warning signs of satanic behavior may be apparent, such as a sudden, bitterly antagonistic attitude towards family and religion, a drastic decline in academic performance, a reclusive behavior pattern, and listening exclusively to heavy metal rock music. Ricky Casso and the murder of Gary Lowers was a bit of a different story. A very real crime took place, and a life was taken brutal. Instead, the media is the culprit in this situation, taking the minor allusion to Satan in Casso's confession, his use of drugs, and his inclusion in the culture of heavy metal, and turning what should have been a highlighting of Gary Lowers' life into another profitable opportunity to continue their fear-mongering. Casso never made it to trial. He checked out the hard way from his confinement and was discovered unresponsive in his cell. With his death, unanswered questions about his method and motive, as well as both parties involved in the incident now absent and unable to speak, the story was taken by media outlets and among the satanic panic spreading throughout the country, morphed it into a fantastical example of the Satan worshippers lurking in the shadows of the American dream. Casso was a troubled kid and he deserved condemnation for what he did. Despite the spotlight his case places on mental health and how youth offenders are handled, even his family expressed regret over his descent into drugs and the occult. Instead, the real victims of the Acid King story and how the media presented it were the public, who would be plunged further into a state of paranoia and fear. But they were just as deep into the hysteria as the rest of the country, so I suppose you can't be too harsh on them. With heavy metal leaning into the satanic elements that elicit a visceral response from parents of angsty teens, it's not hard to see why it was connected and held up as further proof of satanic activity. It's effectively meant to do exactly that, but not in service to the devil, but in service to the freedom of expression we all enjoy in the United States. It's a stigma that would only grow more palpable as bands tried to one-up their predecessors. Venom is topped by Slayer, Slayer by Death, and death by cannibal corpse and others. It's shock rock. It's a similar utilization of the subject matter to the LeVayan Satanists we very briefly touched on earlier. From my pretty basic surface level understanding, Anton LeVay established the church as something of a protest, encouraging the separation of church and state outlined in the First Amendment of the Constitution. At the time of its establishment in 1966, 
An estimated majority of the population were practicing Christians, though exact numbers aren't available. Satanism, in the Levian sense, is a form of symbolic ritualistic atheism. Followers collect under a non-theistic structure to promote values more akin to humanism and skepticism, albeit with a bit of optical flair. With cases like the murder of Elise Poller, the West Memphis Three, and even foreign influences like Euronymous and Mayhem, the music can often attract violent people. But I contend with full confidence that it did not create them. Those are stories that I have told or may tell in the future, but my stance is firmly on the personal responsibility ground. I chose to showcase the Acid King as an example of how moral panic spreads into everything. Like the symbiote, it attaches itself to everything even remotely taboo or occult. And even with the lack of some of the heavier subjects we've covered today, be it the child element or explicit cult activity, Satanic Panic took this case into a realm that it did not belong in and diverted the spotlight for decades from the real issues the case holds as a cautionary tale. Years after Fran and Dan Keller were first accused of abusing children and performing satanic rituals, today the Travis County DA declared the couple innocent. The Kellers have perhaps one of the more harrowing stories. It shares a lot of similarities to the McMartin case, both in accusations and lack of physical evidence. But that didn't deter a jury from condemning them to 48 years in prison. The Kellers would ultimately spend 20 years in prison, and as the fog of satanic panic lifted from the American consciousness, advocacy groups would begin to scrutinize the claims and highlight the lack of evidence. Similar to groups fighting for the West Memphis Three, they would challenge the conviction. In 2013, well outside of the grips of mass hysteria, a judge would acknowledge the severe flaws in their conviction, and the Kellers would be released on bond pending further investigation. Like the McMartin situation, and note the involvement of the Believe the Children organization formed by the parents of those unproven victims, the inconsistency and believability of the children's testimonies, along with the challenging and ultimate debunking of the medical experts' testimony, would lead to exoneration. But it still cost two innocent people 20 years of their lives and a public social slaughtering. It would take until June of 2017 for the Texas Appeals Court to rule in favor of the Keller's exoneration formal. Another witch trial was put into the annals of American history due to suggestive interview techniques being used on vulnerable children, a mass hysteria surrounding anything that even vaguely pointed to satanic activity, and a media that perpetuated that hysteria by believing in it themselves. These examples are far from the only ones that I could have showcased in this video. In fact, to explain the totality of the effects of satanic panic would take much longer than I think you'd be willing to listen to the funny way that I talk. It would need to be presented by somebody far more intelligent than I am. Fear of evil influence is not new. It did not start with satanic panic, and it certainly didn't end with the mainstream consciousness waking up from this hysteria. It's a fable as old as humans, and something unlikely to ever truly go away. What makes satanic panic so special, to me at least, is exactly how widespread it was, even in comparison to something like Beatlemania and the fear that rock and roll was corrupting the baby boomers in their teenage years. It was the combination of not only real-life cult activity like Jonestown and the Manson family, but a rise in dark subject matter from art forms like heavy metal and the rise of therapeutic techniques related to memory recall that are highly defended and contested to this day. The match that lit the fire is widely believed to be Michelle Remembers, the book that we showcased and spoke about. But there's a lot about Michelle and her story that I didn't tell you. Uh, basically, what I remembered was a 14-month period of my life at age five where I was given to a group of people whom at first I wasn't aware of what they were doing other than to a child. They were adults doing things I couldn't understand and that frightened me. About three months, three and a half months into the remembering, I realized through the ritual and repetition that these people had that they were involved in some type of satanic church. In her book, Michelle Smith and co-author slash therapist Dr. Lawrence Pazder detail their sessions and resulting recovered memories of satanic ritual abuse that Smith was subjected to as a child, but suppressed as a means to protect herself. Pazder, in fact, is widely credited as coining the term ritual abuse to describe not only Smith's experience, but those of countless other children arising from similar cases 
discovered after the publishing of their book. However, for decades beyond the claims, there has been no evidence for the validity of the allegations made by Smith beyond her own words, and the techniques have been called into question and scrutinized to the point of being conclusively debunked in some people's eyes. The science of repressed memory is shaky and is both defended and dismissed to this day. If you're interested in a deep dive into the memory wars and a more comprehensive explanation of these techniques and the lives they destroyed, I suggest this video by Matt Orchard. It's one of my favorites on his channel and does a great job of giving you the information without trying to lead you to a specific conclusion. And if Pazder's techniques being called into question wasn't enough, his relationship with his patient and co-author should give you pause. Smith and Pazder would eventually marry, releasing the book as a married couple, something that is quite blatantly against the ethics and oath that health professionals take. With Pazder being one of the few satanic ritual abuse experts in the country, his influence on many of the cases that popped up throughout the 1980s would go far to explain their similarities. These experts in satanic cults would begin to pop up and even make it into the courtroom in many cases, usually going far to sway juries in the courtroom where defense attorneys had their hands tied by judge instructions, like in the case of Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. of the West Memphis Three. To this day, some of these people are adamant that what they experienced was real, their expertise was valid, and that we've all been tricked by the devil into thinking he didn't exist. There are people out there who have vivid memories in their heads of heinous abuse that never happened, implanted into their heads by well-meaning but overzealous therapists. Satanic panic and its list of victims is vast. The media machine that fed the hysteria was likely just as convinced as the public of the existence of these roaming bands of satanic cultists out to do unspeakable things to the most vulnerable of us. A media machine that has only gotten worse as technology advances, feeding fear to a gullible public for profits and engagement to the detriment of our everyday relationships with one another. The cautionary tale of the satanic panic of the 1980s is one that I hope shines a light on your perceptions, moving you towards a future where fear mongers lose their power over you and where you can look at the strangers around you as humans and not evil satanic influences looking to corrupt our youth and destroy our American culture. Because while I contend that most of us have seen the error of our ways, satanic panic never really ended at all. In her most recent concert, Taylor Swift is performing witchcraft. Oh no, this isn't demonic. This isn't demonic. Oh, sorry guys, I thought this was demonic. This isn't demonic. But when I saw this picture of her at the fashion show in Paris, for those who have spiritual discernment, you can see that she had taken part in the humiliation ritual. Usually when an artist goes through a humiliation ritual, Satan will give them more relevancy. Social media platforms like X, TikTok, and even YouTube have the goal of consuming as much of your attention as possible. They want to keep you engaged and looking at whatever content is holding your consciousness hostage so they can sell you advertisements and products and sell your personal data. And that isn't necessarily a negative thing. The attention economy has gone far to reward creative people for their time and effort and goes far to employ and allow a living wage for more people than I think you would realize. It's just how the world works. But what is inarguably negative about this attention economy is how reliable fear and outrage are as a method to hold that attention. Even something like this video, going over something that I imagine has infuriated some of you to hear about, is going to engage your mind a lot better than something a bit less sensational. Where it becomes an issue is when media outlets and grifters intentionally sow seeds of fear in a gullible population, leading to a culture of paranoia and hatred towards whatever other they're aiming that outrage at. You see it particularly in political spaces, but it's everywhere. Taylor Swift is performing satanic rituals at her shows, using the energy of the crowd as some kind of serving to Lucifer. Doja Cat is slowly falling into the grips of demonic possession, and Balenciaga is dog whistling for satanic predators. This is all extremely reminiscent of the moral panic we've covered today. And while I would guess that most of us look at these claims with a dismissive attitude, crediting them to crazy basement dwelling 4chan kids, what's to say that one of these claims wouldn't catch fire and reignite the flames of satanic panic once again. The pilot is still lit, and the mass media machine reaches far deeper than it once did. Don't let other people think for you, no matter how much reverence you may have for them.
As the member of a culture that has leaned into satanic imagery for the sake of shock, art, or anti-censorship, I have been front row to a stigma where those around me assume my allegiance to the Morning Star. I understand it, and it ultimately isn't why I chose to make this video. When I began this script, I wanted to feature stories from an age of mass hysteria because it's a subject that interests me. As I wrote it, I began to see the parallels with our modern age of information and the plausibility of mass hysteria like this rearing its ugly head and leaving a trail of victims in its wake once again. It's a phenomenon that, while I'm not quite intelligent enough to break down psychologically, I think just telling the stories is a great way to give you my interpretation of the age. Religion, well, and has a heavy hand in situations like this, isn't the only ingredient. And through telling these stories, I hope it has become clear that it isn't that people were stupid, it's that they were scared. Clearly, I hold a heavy interest in true crime, heavy metal, and histories related to them. Satanic Panic specifically has come up several times in the videos that I've made, and with each encounter I learned a little more about it. I hope I've been able to put you behind the eyes of a frightened public in an age before the internet took over our perceptions, causing a moral panic that would go down in history as one of the worst. The only responsibility I feel is, is the fact that I, I just, I'm, a, I'm a true musician in of, of what I play. I don't, I don't want to make anybody start doing all this devil worship crap because that's not my intention. Although I have sang on a few songs about the devil, you know, that's about it. You know, I, I don't want anyone to harm themselves. If you rowdy bunch of sinners have made it this far, thank you once again for letting me tell you another tale. I get an immense feeling of satisfaction as these videos come together and I have no intention of slowing down. 2023 has been a fantastic year for us and it's all thanks to you guys for taking the time out of your day to let me tell you stories. 2024 is gonna be the year of the hawk. If you wanna support even further, you can join the Patreon where you'll get early access to videos, podcast episodes and future exclusive content and a special Patreon role in the Discord if you're into that. If you don't feel like waiting for the next big video, I have a catalog of heavy metal history shorts and I post new ones almost daily, so if that sounds like your kind of thing, you're in the right place. Remember to like the video if you liked it, dislike the video if you don't, subscribe to the channel for more, and if you're feeling really generous, tell your friends about it. If you liked this video, you may like the video that I made on the case of Elise Poller, so make sure to check it out. Remember to love your pets, and I'll catch you in the next video. And a big Patreon shout out to Craig, Dr. Spiderface, Leslie, Daniel, Melissa, Jeremy, Richard, Gage, McLean, Weapon Sun Gaming, Lisa, Ryan, and, uh, and my mommy. Hi, Mom. <laughs>